And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and, his, and Jonathan, his son. And he said, it should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. He said, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Let the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. You mountains of, of Gilboa, let it be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan beloved and lovely. In the life and death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, you clothed who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant you have been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Thank you. Be seated and let's pray. Lord, we are coming to your word again. It is your word. It is not my word. It is, this is not the words of men. Uh, these are uh, words that you've given to authors for our growth, for our education, for our instruction, to your glory. And now as we gather this second hour here in this congregation, I ask that you do only what you can do in the hearts of men and women. And that you change our hearts, that you grow us, nurture us, even, even now as, as we begin. Thank you for your place on the throne and your leadership and your care for your people. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, we closed out last week's talking about 1 Samuel, chapter, the closing chapter there in uh, 31, and we see that that the king of Israel has died. King Saul has, has perished. And this is, is news of, of, the, of the superlative kind. It's, it's devastating news. David cannot do well to process it. He, he struggles to, to believe it. It's certainly true. And, and this coming into his hearing is, is devastating. It's, it's, it's the kind of news you don't want to hear. It's the military wife who's waiting for her husband on deployment. And the... the Vehicles pull up, and out of the vehicles approaching the driveway are the men in uniform. That's, that's not what you want. And so the news that he has heard is not what he is wanting, but he hears it nonetheless. Great sorrow, anguish, and distress. We're dealing with David in, in hearing the loss of what happened to his best friend and King Saul. They died. And I think in the text today, I've titled my sermon, The Lessons of Tears. I think what I have seen in, in the close of this chapter is a, a way that we can deal with grief, a, a manner in which we can process the hurts that come our way, because hurts will come your way. We cannot divorce ourselves from that. We cannot protect ourselves from, from, from that. It's going to come. So six lessons, I think, come from the lesson of tears. Let's get right involved here. The effect that this death had on David is, uh, is without measurement. It, it is hard. It is news that he found devastating. It is not comfortable. It cannot be overstated. Look at verse 17 and 18. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he said it should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. And so he said. Now, a few things here I, I, I must talk about. The power of this news on David cannot be overstated, especially in light of Saul being that individual, that le king, that leader over God's people who, who David loved. He loved him. And, and in the beginning of that relationship, it was, it was, it, as, that was, as it was being fostered, it was warm, it was engaging, it, it was careful, it was meaningful, it was humanly compassionate. It was all, all those requisite qualities that we would call quality, and it was wonderful and and David loved Saul very much. And so from immediate friend and confidant and, and loved one, 
that Saul was to David, he becomes his mercurial enemy. And, and in this enemy that he becomes, he becomes full of hatred and, and vitriol and anger and bitterness. And the rest of his life, Saul is spent pursuing how to kill David. That's all he does. Is, is David is now, he's on the hoof. He's running away because Saul so is, is adamant in destroying him that this becomes his penchant. His only goal is to, is to kill him. And so, of course, the hearing of the news that Saul is gone is one thing. But the fact that his best friend Jonathan has also perished is news of, of the heaviest kind. And what does that verse say in verse 17 and 18? That we're to teach it. And he said, it should be taught to the people. Uh, behold, it, it is written in the book of Jeshua. So what is the antecedent of it, or, or what is implied in the word it? Well, it in the Hebrew sense, it in the word usage that we have here, David is saying that it should be taught. This thing that he has in mind, it should be reinforced, it should be composed, it should be vocalized, it should be practiced, it should be a tradition, it should be taught. In other words, it has use. You, you, you instruct somebody in something so they can learn it and it can be valuable to them. So what is the it? It in the Hebrew is the word bow. And bow could mean it's the it's the name of this poem it's the title of this collection of words it is uh, like 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 this like the words composed for a funeral it is an intentional kind of setting of words and it's very illustrative this chant that would be taught to the people of israel they are supposed to learn it david didn't say hear about this once and they don't think about it anymore He's saying this should be taught over and over and over again. So we know that if, he, if it should be taught, then there's value in it. What peril, what death, what difficulty, what duress, what struggle, ain't, you use your adjective, whatever has encountered uh, the people of Israel here that's been difficult, we should teach that. Well, what is a lament? Because it says they, sh they should talk about this lamentation. What is this idea of the lament? A lament is a formal expression of grief. Now notice, a lament is a Formal expression of grief. It is not informal. An informal expression of grief is when you get the news that something devastating has happened and you have an outflow of tears of some immediate words that come out of your mouth. They don't really come from a flow of thought or, or some kind of sentient head knowledge that's procuring these words are going to develop out of your mouth. It doesn't come that way. It just is a flow. It just comes out of you. That's, that's not a lament. A, a lament is, is, is intentional like this in this confined usage. It's a formal. It's thoughtful. It's not an outburst of emotions, but it's an intentional collection of words trying to generate affection and memory and thought and meaningfulness and uh, a way of bringing healing about. And you all know the difference between a letter that's composed with intention versus one that not much thought is given to. Many times my wife will regale some new couple that we're trying to impress um, and, and tell them how great we are, and they never buy it. But sometimes, the, sometimes uh, the, it, she, we will talk about how, you know, how did you meet this person? How did you meet that person? And Lori will talk about the time when I was in the Marine Corps. Right. <laughs> power down now, buddy. Power down. Power down. And so uh, he, he, she, would, she would talk about, and Paul would write these letters, and they were all, oh, and the girls would listen, oh, look at him. And then she would say, in contrast to, my, to the, the guy I used to date, it would be like, yo, babe, what's up? <laughs> We know there's a difference. We know there's a difference. This collection is words are intentional. It's teaching a concept, a thought. It's instilling truth. It's driving affectionate memory. And David knows that there is a lesson to be learned from sadness. That's what he's saying. There's a lesson that should be taught in the times of sadness. As for the book of Jasher, that's a non-canonical book, which means it, it has no place in, in the 66 books of Holy Scripture. But it's also a book that, that in antiquity has been lost. We can't find it. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It's just that book referred to in Joshua chapter 10 is a book that we cannot find. We don't know where it is. It, it's been lost. There weren't certainly manifest in numerous copies of that book, but it doesn't change anything here. So in summary, David is saying, our grief and our sorrow has a lesson. There's a lesson that we can take from times in our life when we are full of sorrow. And so here comes the first lesson I think should come from tears. Number one, tears should wash away many wrongs. Tears should wash away wrongs. Look at verse 19. 
Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. How the mighty have fallen. Now, this is showing David's forgiving spirit, which we saw last week. He's very forgiving. He's very kind, very intentional, very, very, very putting past wrongs in, in their category and, and, and moving forward in grace. This is, this is indicative of, of the, the making of God's man. We're seeing the transition from Saul to David. We're seeing this guy come through God's working. Tears should wash away wrongs. He says, your glory. Who is your glory? Your glory is, is referred to in text. That's Saul. Saul, the leader of Israel, is the glory of Israel, is, 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 the, is the leader God has appointed. And he says, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high His life has been taken. How the mighty, the mighty is, is Saul. Notice here that David is not recalling all the wrongs. He's not calling him that petulant loser who pursued me incessantly. He's finally dead. That would be true, wouldn't it? He doesn't say that. He says, your glory, O Israel, is slain. The mighty, how the mighty have fallen. You can see here that for David in his, in his tears, he's, he's, letting, he's washing away, letting that wash away wrongs. He doesn't have to keep a record of that. He can let it go. He's practicing the, the, the Latin adage, de mortuis nil nisi bonum, which really says this, of, of the wrong, say nothing except that that is good. Of the dead, say only that which is good. This is what, what David is doing. He's not, he's not telling all of us all the legion number of ways that, that Saul in, in his leadership was, was, was poor to say the least and he was, was full of... He doesn't say any of that. It's all gone. So I think one practical thing about point number one is our tears washing away wrongs, it releases you from whatever has happened. It, it, it should release you from that. Don't feel encumbered. Don't feel in bondage to whatever has happened. But move on from that. That's, that's what we see this dirge this lament is beginning to do, and David is showing, it, showing us well. The second thing that tears can do for us is tears should welcome fond memories. Tears should welcome fond memories. David calls both Jonathan and Saul mighty. How the mighty have fallen. He groups them both together. This son and, and what would be the king apparent because that, that's, how, that's how succession works in, this, in antiquity. It would seem here that the, it, it, only natural that Jonathan would, 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 would rise. He says, how the mighty have fallen. He's, he's thinking here of how they have done well in history, how the people have benefited under their leadership, how it wasn't just a time of complete toil and torment and peril and Anger and angst and, and all that negative, all the negation of good. No, there was some good. And so tears should welcome fond memories. David has many, many, many great things to latch on to. Not just the time that spears were hurled across the dinner table. Not just the time that he had to hide and run in the desert. He doesn't just think about those things. He thinks of other times when he could laugh and he could remember the fond things that took place. Well, don't let emotion, don't let times that have been difficult in your life rob you of fond memories. There's good that can come from even difficulty. In other words, you, we can enjoy past memories even if somebody hurt us. Even if someone caused us a, a season of pain, we can still enjoy past memories. That's not wrong. Verse 20. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. Verse 20 is getting at the sad truth of battle. That those who are victors, the Philistines, they, they defeated Israel. They won. They, 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 put, they, they put Israel in the veritable hurt locker, we would say. They lost. Israel lost. They did not win. And when it says, uh, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in Ashkelon, Gath and Ashkelon are two of the five Philistine cities. And the, the, it is mentioned, and not the other three, is, is immaterial. What is material is that it says, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, let the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. What's had here is what has happened to Israel. Write down what has happened to Israel and let everybody know who's going to learn this dirge, let, learn the bow, that we lost that day. And we lost to pagans. Pagans won. And they're going to talk about it all over their cities. 
and it's going to be broadcast everywhere. And if there were, 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 were sports bars at this time on every monitor overhead would be that we whooped Israel. It would be everywhere. You couldn't avoid it. Women were in antiquity were some of the first to, to, to be very public and very vocal in praise and in exaltation of battle victories. And so that, that's what's gotten at there is the women are going to just talk about it. It's going to be everywhere. You will not be able to avoid it. If there's a ticker tape running across a, a, a large screen somewhere, it's going to say Philistines were amazing, led by the uh, uh, amazing team of thus and such, and Israel not so much. And so he's saying it should be broadcast that we didn't win. Which of you likes to remember that? I wrestled in high school. What else am I going to do? <laughs> right? Like, hello? Yeah, I wasn't very good at basketball. I couldn't. Even, I mean, I, I, have, I have a little T-Rex arms. <laughs> Okay, I, anyway, that's another, another sermon. And, you know, I have, I, have, I have the brackets collected in my, in my family's house of, of the times that I made it to the end bracket when I was the victor. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get the bracket that says I lose, and I don't want it. But he's telling them, remember the times that you lost. And when you lost, someone is going to gloat over the fact that they won. But that's okay. That's okay. We can process this. And notice too, maybe, maybe this sense is, is you know, just kind of obvious. Not only is the Philistine occupation and, 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 and the population as a whole going to be thankful about their victory, they're going to view it as not only a military victory, they're also going to view it as a religious victory. So it's a double hit. Dagon led us to victory, people. Dagon defeated the God of Israel. Do, do, do you see the import here of what David is saying? That we, we gotta write this stuff down. That like this is this is not a this is not this is a black eye for Israel, but we should still be mindful of it. We can't divorce ourselves from the reality that it took place. Remember again, the people are gonna recall what has happened, they're gonna reflect on what has happened. But it's part of their ongoing faith then, because if there's a lesson to be taught here, then there must be a lesson to be learned. And many of you and many of us can often be so reticent to learn a lesson that comes from pain. We'd rather shove it, bury it, hide it, than learn from it. And this, this is not the, the, the direction of Scripture here at all. Again, this, this bow song is not a sweep it under the rug thing, which is what so many of us do. We repress and we wonder why ongoing there's a re residual impact on our lives that we never seem to be able to overcome or get over this because we have not processed it properly. We have not learned the bow. The third thing that follows the, fir the first two is that tears should not discourage pains. Tears should not discourage pains. Because what happens so often to us in this life is things are going to be hard, really hard, very difficult. We call this life. Life happens. Look at verse 21. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. Verse 21 is, is another, again, another way of recollection of a failure. Israel was not victorious. But they're, but they're memorializing the loss here. So there's a value in things that even are hard. We like lessons that only come from things that are easy. We don't like lessons that come from things that are hard. But that was hard. That was a hard day. Very difficult. What we're getting at here on uh, that painful day is everything that took place, the seeming curse that was upon them, the fact that they, they, they did not win, and that, and that two beloved leaders of, of, of Israel, were, were, their lives were, were taken from them on the battlefield. Th there was blight, there was, there was, there was draw, drought, it was, uh, it was ugly, it was bad on ha what happened on that mountain. Again, he calls the mighty that they were defiled. Notice it says, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. Now, the word, the phrase in, in 21 on the tail end, not anointed with oil, there's, there's a, a, a manifold number of, of explanations for that, but I think two that, that stand to, to have some sense for us 
is in antiquity, the battle implements of warriors, if they had leather on their surfaces, in the case, let's say, of a shield or, or whatever, they would, would rub slash anoint that with oil to keep it permeated and to keep it moist so it would not dry and crack out. Uh, because if it did, then it would not have the ability as, as a device to have uh, efficacy or usefulness, and it would need replaced. And so it could be that that's what's gotten at here is that it, 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 didn't, it wasn't efficacious. It didn't work. It, it didn't provide what was intended. It wasn't anointed with oil. It wasn't sealed. It could be that. Or it could be the fact that Saul was never the one anointed to lead the people of Israel. And we know that for certain because he's not. He was never going to be the one. He was never going to be the one anointed ultimately in the sense to lead. It would be David, not Saul. And so even that is, is just a, 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 a sober recollection of, of God's sovereignty. I think too about this idea of tears should not discourage pains. For you, you don't have to pretend that everything's okay sometimes. You don't have to pretend. If something's hard, let it be hard. If something's very ominous in a, in a time of your life, let it be that. But trust God. Press into God. Love the people of God. Seek other counsel from people who care about to walk with you. Don't pretend everything's okay because most people are smart enough to know it's not okay. You're not okay. You're pretending it's okay, but you're not okay. He continues in verse 22. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. In other words, here is all the effects of battle, all the results of war. It has taken the vigor of life, it has drained it. It has taken the blood in the body and has spilled it onto the ground. The fighting has left its mark. We cannot change the marks that have come from battle. None of that can come back. We can't retract it. What is done is done. Blood has been spilled. In other words, the, the, the arrow has been shot. The, 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 the sword has, has been swung. The, the, the pike has been thrust. And, and you can't get that back. The arrow launched cannot come back. The sword swung can, cannot be unswung. The, the thrusting pike cannot be undone. It, it is done. No matter of, 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 of passing of time is going to take away the fact of what happened here. It's done. Again, notice the bow, which is going back to the name of this dirge, going back to the name of this lament. Uh, briefly, I, I, I remind you of 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel um, 20, in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, Jonathan is aware of his dad losing his mind. He's turned mercurial. He's turned full of anger and, and, and bitterness. And so he, ha he recognizes that he has to help his friend have a, a, a life that's, that's safe and meaningful and protected. So he, he, he comes up with a, a, a ruse, if I may, a, 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 a trick. It's not really a trick. It's, it's just a way of conveying information that, that needs to be conveyed. So he says, hey, we're going to go out here to this field. We're, we're going to shoot the bow. And I'm going to be very vocal. You're going you're to be out there where you can hear. My dad's not going to know you're there. And if, the, if, the, if I say that the, that the arrow is here, you'll know it's safe. If I say the, the arrow is beyond you, you have been released. You need to go. Your time here is over. Your season like this is done. You will now embark on a new season and you need to go. But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. There again is this idea of the bow. But I think it's also uh, clear in the bow is 1 Samuel 31.3. And in 31.3, this is not the bow of Jonathan. This is the bow of the enemy. And the bow of the enemy is that the archer's arrows found Saul and he was wounded. There again, you see a linkage of the idea of the word bow. One more thing that I think is interesting do any of you, look at verse 22 again, do any of you see anything interesting about the ordering of the list of names? Whose name is listed first in verse 22? Let me hear it. Jonathan's name is listed first. Is Jonathan's name listed first anywhere else in this, in this bow? No. What does that mean? 
It means what we, we would typically see in the New Testament and in other documents of old is typically the person who had the more honor or more prestige or who was the person, you know, of some kind of regal manner. His name would always be first and any subsequent subordinate would always be second. It's a way of showing importance. Paul puts that on his head in the book of Ephesians, upsetting the order of male and female uh, children and parents and slaves and frees, where you would typically expect the, the Greek order of the day would always put the, the wife subservient to the husband in a negative way, that the, that the slaves would be obviously under their place as the master and the children in a negative place over their parents. Paul changes that around and lists wives first, slaves first, children first. This is showing you just how much affection. It's like a slip. It, it, it's, a, it's a veritable slip of hand maybe where, 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 where David is thinking about his friend who he loved so much and here he puts his name first. It, to me, it's, it's, it's no, it's no um, accident. It's not an accident. But we'll get to that in just a minute. Well, unlike sung, uh, swords rather that have been swung and and thus and such, God's word, when it is spoken, will never return void. It will also do what it's intended to do, always, in every case. It will always do what it's intended to do. Isaiah 45, 23. Isaiah 45, 23 says, By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. And then the, the locus of where we most commonly refer and say that the, God's word will not return void comes from Isaiah 55, 11. And 55.11 says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Which brings me to my fourth lesson of tears. Four. Tears should allow for differentiation. Tears should allow for differentiation. I think David loved Saul less. Now, the way I said that is not how normally we speak. We don't speak like that. We would say, I think Saul loved somebody more, right? We don't, we don't, we don't really talk in negation. We talk in, in positive ways. But I think it's obvious that David loved Saul less. That's not a bad thing. He loved Saul, but he loved Jonathan more. I have two daughters. Some of you have daughters. Listen, I hate to put rain on your parade, but I love my daughters more than your daughters. <laughs> right? That's natural. That's okay. I have neighbors that mean th the world to me. I love my neighbors more than I love your neighbors. Does that make me evil? Does that make me not kind? Does it make me not pastoral? Some of you are thinking, I'm fine in a different church where that pastor will love my kids like he loves his kids. Exactly. <laughs> then you better love my kids like you love yours and send me some money for college to reimburse me because I'm hurting baby I'm hurting no tears should allow for differentiation it's okay we will not love the same and we will and, but, and we will not necessarily be hurt the same and that's okay because listen Jesus wept over Jerusalem but not over Bethpage not over the, the city of the Gerasenes he didn't, he didn't weep over them but he wept over Jerusalem even Jesus tears are differentiated it's okay for there to be a differentiation in our tears. That's okay. Verse 23 shows more of, of the reality of these fallen men. Look at verse 23. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. I, I, I love that imagery. I love that, that picture that forms in my mind's eye. They, they were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Here again is a kind of mini tribute that, that David gives to these warriors. Again, not, not a recollection of wrongs. Not here's how they blew it. Here's how you pursued me. Here's how it wasn't fair. Here's how I suffered. Here's where I, where I couldn't, this, that, and the other. And here's where I needed to take some alprazolam. None of that. Just a tribute. Not a record of wrongs. He said this father and son, they were together. They served together. They fought together. They were protecting each other. They were honoring each other. They were giving of, of all they could give. And they had many successes for Israel as a whole. Listen, it wasn't like just like it was a blight under, under them the whole entire time. There, there was some good that took place here. They had many successes for Israel. 
And while this defeat took away their life, it did not take away all that they did well in the past. Some of you, you, you forget everything that has ever been positive to come from some experience in your life at the, at the outset of something being good or bad. Something bad, like somehow it's washed away and made void everything that's good that's happened in the past. That's not true. You can still celebrate what has been good in the past. Implicit, too, in this verse about this father and son together losing their life is the faithfulness of Jonathan toward his dad, that be, that, that, to say it easily, who's becoming crazy. 1 Samuel 20, verse 30 and 31. This is, this is Saul towards his son. This is Saul speaking towards his son. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse, that's David, to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? I mean, that's harsh words of a father to his son. Did Jonathan say, you know what, Dad? You know what? I, I, I'm out of here. You, you, you wounded my, my sensitive feelings. I'm out of here. I, 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 I'm, ta I'm taking my stuff. I'm moving to Phoenix. I'm out of here. I'm done with you. No, he stayed. He stayed with his father. He understood what was going on. He understood his dad has fallen. He stayed with him. He fought with him. He would give his life for his dad. And this is a tribute saying that Jonathan also stayed faithful even to the very fighting end. See again, David is only, only listing successes, not troubles. What shortcomings? He doesn't list any of that. Not at all. Well, as we advance forward, verse 24, 25, and 27, we'll get to 26 in a minute. It shows the very opposite of verse 20. If in the five Philistine cities is going to be the praise and, and the, the banners hung and the, the ticker tapes running and the big screens telling of the victory, it's going to be the very opposite in Israel. It's going to be the very opposite. There's going to be weeping. There's going to be the recollection of all that he had done in, in giving us scarlet and ornaments. That, that's really just meaning that under his leadership, Israel had safety for a time. Under his leadership, Israel was taken care of. God used him. This, it was good for us. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. battle. That's, what, that's, that's what they're learning there. The Israelite women are going to be mourning while the Philistine ladies are having a great time. Again, he's saying, record this. Write this down. Teach it. We need to be mindful of what happened here. Which again tells you there's a lesson that can come from our tears. The prospering under Saul is over. Battle has ended this era under this king. And what we're going to be able to see moving forward in the biography of David is watching what God is doing in David. Which takes me to my fifth point before our, our exhaustive sixth point, number five. Tears should remind us of grace. Tears should remind us of grace. Because the reality is, friends, it's not always ugly when it's hard. It's not always, always, always ugly when it's hard. My wife and I had the privilege to take a young couple to dinner this past week, and, and this couple was, was going through a difficult time, and they, they, they find the season of life with job and, and family and children and just, just finances. They, they, it's hard. And we reminded them what we would say to over and over again to people is, this season might just be a season that's just going to be hard. But this too shall pass. Life is going to be hard sometimes. And when it is hard, it doesn't mean we have to wash away everything that's ever been a grace to us by God's goodness in the past. We call that common grace. God still shows and allows common grace even in a world full of sin. We can cling to that. We can remember that. We can rejoice in that. Tears should remind us that when we weren't crying, in other words, there were times when we weren't crying, when we were laughing, when we were high-fiving each other. There were times like that. And so tears can remind you of that very powerfully. Now, let me just say here as a pastoral aside, this idea of writing down these words which are formal, meaningful, well-chosen, structured, there's even some chiastic pieces in here that kind of be, where it begins and kind of where it ends. It kind of pulls together, but not, not wholly. There's, there's meaningfulness in writing down and processing our grief. And one, of the, one, one pastoral, one practical counseling uh, strategy when we were dealing with people with grief is to encourage them to write down what they're dealing with, what they're struggling with. 
some bitterness, some, something in the soul that they cannot move beyond, and maybe they've never processed that, they've never really talked about it, but, but it's bottled up and it's stuck and it can't come out, is it would be encouraged to the couple or the individual to, to take a pen, go home and write down and pour out yourself, pour out your grief, give vent to your emotions, write down, list names, talk about how that feels, get it out of you. It's meaningful. It's, it's, it's a kind of catharsis. It does have benefit to the soul. And I think, I think that's one of the lessons I would give to you here. If any of you are dealing with something that you, you've had a real difficult time moving beyond, maybe it's time for you to, to write a bow and, 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 and put to pen, to paper, what, what, how you are feeling. And then I, I think the next step, which is very useful, is put it in an envelope. And maybe because you want to not add... Uh, additional hurt on somebody else instead of maybe send it to the recipient maybe instead you put it in the mailbox that you would also call the trash and you put it away from you and, you, and you, you're done with it you write it you get it out and you, you discard it you put, you put it where it belongs I would encourage us to follow this kind of, of meaningfulness I think it's helpful but with that let's go, we'll go to verse 26 verse 26 again is showing you the very real Love that these two men had for each other. Jonathan, the best friend of David. David, the best friend of Jonathan. These men had real, meaningful love for each other. Nowhere in this verse is it implicit that there was some kind of illicit sexual uh, relationship taking place between two men. Nowhere is this an illustration of homosexual behavior. Nowhere is this an accommodation for two men that erred and slipped and, and practiced something that they should have and they let it later repented of and came back to sentient minds and, and logical flow of monogamy. Nowhere is that implied in hetero, heterosexual expression. Not, not in view. What is in view is two men that loved each other as the best of friends. And they cared for each other deeply and and with strength that has no ability to be measured. And that kind of engagement they had with each other, David says, your love to me like that was was better than that of women. He's not saying that you gave me love that was better than be a woman. It's not saying that the, the, the relations that a man and has man has with a woman is somehow subservient or secondary to this kind of love. It doesn't take that away. It's just saying this they had a kind of relationship that had no equal. And it's over. And, and, and this will deeply impact David for all of his life. That's all it's saying. His best friend is gone. This week, one of my staff members uh, texted me and said, Pastor, I, I need some prayer. I need some prayer. I, I, I just, I had, you know, my friend so-and-so died, you know, uh, a couple months ago. And, and that's been really difficult for me to process. And he leaves behind four young children. And I, I don't know how his wife's going to make it. And then now I just learned last night that Another friend of mine died, and, and like I'm really struggling. I'm really, really having a hard time dealing with this grief in my life. And all I could do, what, which is what I would do for you, is just try to encourage you to, to have the long view in mind and to trust God. And we know that, that this life is going to be marked with difficulty and pain and sorrow, but that does not change the outlook of God's still good. And he's on the throne, and he works all things together for good. You know, things are hard. We, and I, I just try to encourage him, and he told me, you know, that he's, he's, doing, he's doing better, and, he, and, and he's thankful. And we're going to have grief. We're going to have sorrow. We're going to cry. And maybe we're even going to have anger. But it has a usefulness to us. It's, it's a gift to us to process what comes our way. Which takes me to my final point. Tears should instruct one's life. Tears should instruct one's life. My life, your life, whatever happens to us, we should learn from it. What happened to Saul and Jonathan, what happened on Gilboa was real. That was a real mountain with real dirt that collected real soul, real, that had real soil upon it that drew real blood from real warriors that gave their life. None of that was pretend. It's a real place. It's a real memorial there. That was a real event. No one has to pretend that it didn't happen. It happened. We don't have to create some kind of fantasy for some smooth kind of life. That's talking about living a lie. That's living a lie. The fact that what has happened is, is truth. And that's good even though it might be hard. What happens to you, what happens to me is real in this life. I think this text is reminding us of how David is dealing with it and is a template in a loose kind of way. That's a good thing for us too. We're driven to God in times that are good and in times that are bad because he doesn't change. 
Friends, uh, this concludes uh, chapter 1. We will begin, God willing, at chapter 2 as now we begin to see the transition from Saul to David. It's going to be glorious and it's going to be messy. Until we meet again, let us pray.